What is the Broncos' long-term outlook at the cornerback position? Patrick Zertan set to be extended, but who will emerge? We break that down here on today's brand new episode, Locked on Broncos. You are Locked on Broncos, your daily Denver Broncos podcast. Part of the Locked on Podcast Network, your team every day. What's up, Broncos country? Welcome into a brand new episode of Lockdown Broncos, your daily Denver Broncos podcast, part of the Lockdown Podcast Network, your team every day. To all the everydayers out there in Broncos country, thank you so much for tuning in and making us your first listen of the day. Every single day, you can get this podcast for free on YouTube, or you can get it wherever you get your podcast. So please do us a favor. If you haven't done so already, make sure you hit that subscribe or that follow button down below so you never miss out on what's going on with your favorite team as the buildup for the NFL Draft continues. I'm Cody Rourke. I cover the Broncos as a reporter for Mile High Sports. Joined alongside, as always, by my guy, Sarah Bettinger. He's the site expert over there at predominantlyorange.com here. And look, we open things up with a mailbag edition on today's episode of the show. And one of the questions that we're really going to start off with for the Broncos is, what is their long-term outlook at the cornerback position? And this was a question that was sent in from our good friend Chase12270 on Twitter I think it's a very valid question. And to be honest with you, Sarah, I feel like the Broncos' long-term outlook at this position, outside of quarterback, this is a huge question for the team going into this upcoming season. It's a question for the team, but in my mind, Cody, this is a, a question that they've answered already with multiple different players. They've got Riley Moss that they traded up for in last year's draft specifically. They they selected him with the 83rd overall pick, but they also gave up a pick in the early portion of the fourth round last year, and they gave up a third round selection in the 2024 NFL draft to select Moss. I know that's a lot of pressure to put on a guy who was picked 83rd overall. But to me, Cody, the, the Broncos have to they have to buy into a guy that they invested so much in. I mean, they gave up essentially a second round value in order to select Moss in last year's draft. So to me, that long term solution is on the roster. The thing is, is that we haven't really got to see him play at the NFL level. He didn't play in the preseason due to injury. He was mostly a special teamer throughout the regular season last year. So I think it's a question mark. For, from the outside looking in because we haven't seen him play, but the Broncos invested there. It, it's it's no different than in previous years when you know you had to bank on Draymond Jones coming up as a as a third round selection. You banked on him playing well. Last last year the Broncos banked on Baron Browning and Nick Benito, two guys who were picked in the you know the third and second round. So you have to bank on these guys that you invested in, even though you haven't seen much from them yet. Riley Moss to me and Damari Mathis, quite frankly, has starting experience as well. And you shouldn't give up on him. It, the Broncos, I think, have their long term solutions. We just have yet to see it play out. I can agree with that. And look, I think a lot of people are, are overlooking Damari Mathis in a big way. A guy who stepped up in his rookie season, played impactful minutes, had an impact for the Broncos in his rookie season. Had a little bit of a rough year last year in some spurts. He also had some plays where he made some great plays on the ball, pass breakups, things like that. Damari is still very, very capable of starting in the NFL. Riley Moss, obviously, is a guy that's going to be thrown into the mix. These guys were initially set to compete last year in training camp. We all know Riley had the core muscle surgery, so that kind of threw a, a wrinkle into those plans. Damari ended up hurting his ankle during training camp and missed some time there. Like That impacted him going into the regular season. That's not talked about enough. I will say maybe some other names to keep an eye on here. Maybe nothing, or maybe no, names that nobody would expect, right? But maybe to keep an eye on here. Art Green, undrafted rookie free agent, is another option at six foot one, over 200 pounds. Like he was a guy who was very, very crucial to Denver's practice squad last year in terms of their scout team. He's got range. He's a guy that could develop very nicely. And I'm very curious to see maybe what Jim Leonard can do with a guy like Art Green. Can he maybe elevate a little bit further here? and get more run here during training camp. That's something that I would be very eager to see. Now, I will say that in terms of Denver addressing this in the long term, I think that you can make the argument that, hey, like they're hoping that Damari O'Reilly can be those options. But I also want to go back to their perceived interest in Christian Fulton just a few weeks ago, ended up signing with the Los Angeles Chargers. Denver was interested in signing him. So does that mean that they just want to get a veteran to be sure of in the event that these guys can't win that job or don't necessarily stand out in a big way, something to keep an eye on here. And look, I think when we look at some of the veteran free agent names that are still available, Xavier and Howard at this point, Avante Maddox, who played for the Philadelphia Eagles. And look, even a Dory Jackson from the New York giants. He said he's still a free agent here. JC Jackson's a free agent, but to be honest with you, sir, 
I don't see JC at this point. He may even take a year off from football, or he might be this low, like he might sign for a low amount of money somewhere. I just don't think that he'd also be a fit in Denver, considering that there's been some stuff going on with him that I think maybe in his life he's got to get prioritized first. I want to know your thoughts on maybe still adding a veteran to the mix here as the Broncos prepare for the NFL draft and get ready for, obviously, OTAs. Certainly not opposed to the Broncos adding a veteran name. Like you mentioned, they were in on Christian Fulton and apparently had an offer on the table for him, which I was kind of surprised to find out. And I'll have to I'd have to do some more research on this, Cody, because Christian Fulton, I know early on in his time with the Titans, he played inside the slot. So that would be that would be interesting to know, like more recently, where was he playing and where would the Broncos have projected him? And, and I know Jaquan McMillan has you know, proven that he can play in the slot as well. But maybe the Broncos are hedging their bets there and saying, let's give him some competition. Right. Let's not just hand him the job. We saw how that went for Damari Mathis last year. So maybe the Broncos are thinking that same way along the lines with the, the slot corner position. Could that be Riley? And- could be Riley Moss. It absolutely. I mean, the, and that's what I think I'm I'm kind of going towards here is that the Broncos have options at the cornerback position with youth and they've invested so much at this position. I think almost every year but 2019, the Broncos have added a top 100 player at corner it, with the exception of Damari Mathis in 2022 being picked like I can't remember if it was 112 or 110 or what something in the you know early portion of round four. So bo- borderline top 100 pick. You had 2018, Isaac Yadam, 2020. You had Michael Ojemudia, 2021, Pat Sertan in the first round. 22 was Damari Mathis, 23, Riley Moss. So the Broncos, they've thrown so many darts at this position that like even for George Payton, who has drafted so many defensive backs, like the cornerback position, if you haven't got it right yet, like I'm screaming from the mountaintops, do not draft a corner in round one again this year. Like, please, like I just, I, not that I have anything against Terry and Arnold or Quinion Mitchell from Toledo. I have nothing against those guys. Hope they have great professional careers. Just they, they're they're not what the Broncos need right now compared to everything else in this draft class. So that's what I'm saying, Cody, the long-term plan at corner. I think it's just the devil you know versus the devil you don't. And I think a lot of times people would rather kill these knees with fire and say, well, let's go sign the biggest name in free agency or let's go after a first-round draft pick at the position you've already got guys on the roster that your coaching staff and front office believe in. I think it's time for the Broncos to put their money where their mouth is there. Broncos country. We want to know how you feel about the Broncos long-term outlook at the cornerback position. Are you comfortable with it as is with Patrick Sertan, who's set to be extended this year, by the way, and also Riley Moss, Damari Mathis being in the mix to compete for that cornerback two spot. Let us know how you feel. If you're listening or watching the lockdown Broncos, wherever you get your podcasts or available on YouTube. We're going to continue our mailbag question. We got a great question from an avid listener of the show who asked us the question, are the Broncos going to be any good in 2024? We'll share our early outlook here on today's brand new episode, Locked on Broncos. Today's episode of Locked on Broncos is brought to you by our friends over there at Robinhood. Did you know that even if you have a 401k for retirement, you can still have an IRA? Robinhood has the only IRA that gives you a 3% boost on every dollar you contribute when you subscribe to Robinhood Gold. But get this, now through April 30th, Robinhood is even boosting every single dollar you transfer in from other retirement accounts with a 3% match. That's right. No cap on the 3% match. Robinhood Gold gets you the most for your retirement thanks to their IRA with a 3% match. This offer is good through April 30th. Get started at Robinhood.com slash boost. Subscription fees apply. And now for some legal info. Claim as a Q1 2024 validated by Radius Global Market Research. Investing involves risk, including loss. Limitations apply to IRAs and 401ks. 3% match requires Robinhood Gold for one year from the date of first 3% match. Must keep Robinhood IRA for five years. The 3% matching on transfers is subject to specific terms and conditions. Robinhood IRA available to U.S. customers in good standing. Robinhood Financial LLC member SIPC is a registered broker dealer. Are the Denver Broncos going to be bad in 2024? Should we just prepare the paper bags now or could they be better? Could they overachieve based on the expectations Cody and I, Cody's getting his paper bag or I guess his Carhartt hat ready just in case it looks so bad on the field. But we're going to talk about whether or not we actually think, hey, are the Broncos at some of the betting sites? Cody got these guys at five and a half wins over under. And I saw ESPN ranked the third worst roster 
in the NFL. We're going to break down whether or not the Broncos are actually going to be that bad this season on today's episode, Locked On Broncos. But want to say thank you to every single one of you that makes Locked On Broncos your first listen of the day, every single day, wherever and however you listen to podcasts. Or if you watch the show on YouTube, we appreciate every single one of you for following along. You truly do make the show what it is. And Broncos country, thanks for rocking with us all off season long as we discuss the potential of a miserable season. I think a lot of fans are anticipating misery this year, Cody, because currently the quarterback position is unresolved. You're getting outside analysts like ESPN, whoever compiled their list of the best and worst rosters in the league saying the Broncos are the third worst roster in the NFL. Currently. I just, To me, we've been talking about it lately on the show, Cody. I've been talking about the Broncos kind of raising the floor this offseason, but I want to give you the floor here. What do you perceive as far as this team's, like, they won eight games last year with Mm -hmm. a a horrible passing attack and historically bad defense through the first six, seven weeks of the year. What do you perceive this team to be heading into 2024? And a one and five start, you know, that they had as well. And they were able to climb their way out of it to get to 500, to get a game above 500. Like Denver made some moves last year that surprised me. You and I, after that Miami Dolphins episode, were like, hey, the season is over. Like we jumped onto that train because that was the most embarrassing loss we've ever seen from the Broncos. Um, and, And for them to respond the way that they did, I think is a testament. Look, you know, even going to the locker room the following week, talking to players are like, hey, like that's not who we are. We're embarrassed by it. We're going to be better. And sure enough, they got better. I, I, I have confidence in it. Now, obviously, like some of the sports books out there, FanDuel and them, they have the Broncos at five and a half wins. And fans have the expectation that they're going to be bad. Fans are either going to be you know, on par with their expectation or they're going to be pleasantly surprised. I think that Denver's going to win over five and a half games next year. I don't, I mean, I think that's a pretty low bar to set. I think it's very fair. I think Denver's going to exceed that. But from Ed Holinsky, who really asked us this question as well, what you know, will they be good or will they be bad if we looked into our crystal ball? I want to break it up based on personnel units, right? So first off, let's talk about Denver's offense, and I'm curious for years on this. I think that the Broncos can be competitive, and I think that they can win some games if they have a quarterback under center that can operate the offense the way that Sean wants. Now, how does Sean want to operate? Look, he wants the ball out quickly. He doesn't want his quarterback to take unnecessary sacks. But there has to be a balance between the run game as well, sir. And I think that's absolutely critical. Like for me, Denver can win and be competitive if the offense has the quarterback under center that can make those plays and not make the same mistakes that kind of plagued them a little bit that they saw last year. On the offensive side of the ball, in terms of if we're breaking down from this category, where do you stand on it? Well, I just feel like if the Broncos are going to do what Sean Payton says, you know, when he's asked what's the the biggest way you can improve the offense after what we saw last season, he says, like you mentioned, taking fewer sacks. If if they can do that and if they're not turning the ball over at an astronomically high rate, you kind of expect the offense to progress because, like I said, they were a bottom five passing attack last year for most of the season and, and worse for a lot of the season as well. And what I what I mean by that is not just in terms of overall passing yardage, it's percentage of passing plays that go for a first down. The Broncos were one of the worst teams in the NFL, and they were one of the only teams until late in the season to have such a bad mark in terms of the percentage of overall passing plays that were successful that only used one quarterback. And it was Russell Wilson for most of the year. So that I think Sean Payton seems to feel like that was the common denominator in the lack of offensive success. And we saw things boil over after that Houston Texans game, didn't we? Where the Broncos went 0 for 13 on third downs or 0 for 11. I can't remember the exact number, but it was an 0 for on third down. And they just couldn't throw the ball efficiently. They needed the defense to come through with so many turnovers. I just don't think you're going to necessarily need that every single year in the NFL. And that's just, I do think the Broncos, I mean, it doesn't feel like it based on personnel right now, but I feel like they're going to be better in 2024 offensively. I did like the addition of Josh Reynolds. And look, if Cortland Sutton and Tim Patrick, if those guys stay healthy, I like the four receiver group of Tim, Cortland, Marvin Mims, and now Josh Reynolds into the mix. And hey, if Greg Dulcich stays healthy, there is a legitimate option for you that can have a breakout year. Lucas Crow, I've been on the record of saying it here on the show, I think is going to surprise a lot of people this upcoming season. And you have a veteran guy who's reliable in terms of being an outlet option, and Adam Troutman, who is not necessarily going to be required to be the number one guy this year at the tight end position. That, I think, will help things go. And if you get the run game going, I mean, the opportunities are endless here, Sarah. I think that they can 
Braves are definitely above the five and a half win bar this upcoming season. Now, if we talk about defense, we talked about really throughout this season how historically bad Denver's defense got off to a start. I mean, that game against the Miami Dolphins impacted them so negatively from a statistical standpoint that every single week afterward, like even when Denver's defense got better, they still ranked bottom in so many major categories because of the output that they gave up. They allowed 70 points. And on top of that, they allowed almost 1,000 yards of offense. You know, they were just 300 yards shy there, 700 plus yards of offense the Dolphins gained there. That was embarrassing, and that impacted them from a statistical ranking all throughout the season. But if you watch the film, they got better. Then at the end of the season, they had some breakdowns in pass coverage, something that George Payton alluded to. They struggled to stop the run in key moments, and that really hurt them overall in the, the final stretch of the season where the Broncos at some point were like, you know what, all right, this isn't going to work. We're going to bench Russ for these final two games, protect him from getting injured so we don't have to pay that $35 million injury guarantee. And then on top of that, now we're just going to roll with Jarrett for these next two games, and you didn't really get to see a good inclination out of that. Now I think that Denver's defense – Against the Chargers, played really well. Against the Raiders, not so much. They gave up the explosives through the air. But I do think that they are going to be better. I like the additions that they've made. And I think that they are going to beefen things up here in the NFL draft, specifically on the defensive line. The bigger question here is who's going to replace Justin Simmons and how big of an impact will him missing on the field will that be for Denver this season? If Caden Stearns, P.J. Locke, and Brandon Jones can stay healthy, I really think that Denver's defense is going to be drastically better this year than they were last year. And I think that's something that we have to keep an eye on here. And if the defensive front is better, like you mentioned, Cody, if the defensive front can come come up big this year, you know, for lack of a better term and no pun intended, I mean, those guys are going to make everybody else better. The secondary is going to be better if the defensive line is generating more pressure. If the edge guys are generating more pressure, the, the secondary is going to be a lot better. The linebackers are going to be a lot better if the defensive line is doing its job. And if the Broncos can find a way to get that much better on the defense, of line to be able to kind of control the line of scrimmage and dictate the pace and play of the game that this team's ceiling Cody I don't, I don't know what I mean Sean Payton in the the 2021 New Orleans Saints that was ultimately not his best team in New Orleans right they won nine games and they had four different quarterbacks starting for them and and a number of undrafted players that had to come into the lineup due to injuries and you just look at that and I just feel like I feel like Broncos country, a lot of times we underrate what Sean Payton is capable of doing in terms of raising the floor of this team. I would be shocked, and I guess I, I can get memed for this. I'd be shocked that the Broncos are worse than six wins this coming season. I just would be. I mean, it doesn't matter to me who's necessarily playing quarterback. It doesn't. I mean, it does, but it doesn't. It's like Sean Payton is that kind of coach that I think he believes he can go out there with whatever chess pieces he has, and he can beat the other team at chess. And I think that un that aspect goes vastly underrated a lot of times when you talk about having a talent level that surpasses. The Broncos may not need to just win based on talent going forward when they have a coach like Sean Payton who knows how to win the chess match. Well, and I think another thing as well, you see a lot of people talking about, well, Sean going to punt on 2024. That's not the type of coach that Sean is. And so that whole idea, that notion, I don't buy into it. I don't believe it. I do think that Denver, I mean, sir, I think that's, I would take the over six at this point. Like if I'm taking where you're at, like I don't see them being worse than six wins. I think that they'll win more than six games this upcoming season. Now, will there be seven games? Will there be eight games again? Look, there's a lot of pressure. Even, you know, you look at Greg Penner coming out and saying like, hey, we had eight wins this past year. We need to win more next year. So there is pressure on Sean. There's pressure on the organization to do it right. But maybe because of the fact that the Broncos have embraced a little bit of a mini rebuild in a sense, even though they're not saying it's a rebuild, maybe that has bought them a little bit more leeway, some more room to operate with going into 2024. So that will be an interesting thing to see. We're going to continue our mailbag episode here of Lockdown Broncos. Today, Broncos country, we get asked the question, would we prefer Dak Prescott in 2025 or Shadur Sanders? We'll share our thoughts on that here on today's episode, Lockdown Broncos. Today's Lockdown Broncos podcast is brought to you by our friends over there at the Game Time app. Game Time is now an authorized ticket marketplace of Major League Baseball, which makes getting tickets even faster and easier. Prices on the Game Time app, they actually go down the closer it gets to the first pitch. So make sure you take advantage of that if you want to go to Coors Field to watch the Colorado Rockies play. One thing I love about the Game Time app, they have last minute deals where you can save up to 60% off buying last minute for sports, concerts, comedy, theater, and other events that are going on in your area. On top of that, they have flash deals, they have zone deals. 
all-in price and which allows you to toggle the feature, which shows you your total up front. And that will leave you with no surprise fees at checkout. And on top of that, they can show you the vantage point that you're going to get of all the action from your seat with seat views. You get a panoramic view from your seat in the app before you even buy. So take the guesswork out of buying tickets with game time. Download the game time app, create an account, and use code locked on NFL for $20 off your first purchase. Terms apply. Again, create an account, redeem code locked on NFL for $20 off. Download the game time app today. Last minute tickets, lowest price guaranteed. Today's Locked On Broncos is also brought to you by our friends over there at eBay Motors. Passion, drive, and patience. The formula for winning championships is also what keeps your ride or die alive. eBay Motors, they have everything that you need to maintain your vehicle and level it up to peak performance. Superchargers, roof racks, exhaust kits, LED headlights, and more. Whether you're to speed, power, or style, eBay Motors, they've got you covered. With over 122 million parts for your number one ride or die, you'll always find exactly what you're looking for. And with eBay Guaranteed Fit, your part is guaranteed to fit your ride every time or your money back. Because with eBay Motors, you're burning rubber, not cash. With all the parts that you need at the prices that you want, it's easy to make your car the MVP and bring home huge wins. Keep your ride or die alive at ebaymotors.com. Once again, that's ebaymotors.com. Eligible items only. Exclusions apply. eBay Guaranteed Fit only available to U.S. customers. As we jump into the fourth quarter action on today's episode, Locked On Broncos, a special mailbag edition courtesy of members in Broncos country. We just want to say thank you so much for tuning in, making us your first listen of the day every single day. You guys make the show exactly what it is, so we appreciate you so much to all the avid listeners out there in Broncos country. Sarah, we got uh, several more mailbag questions we're going to have to get through here on today's episode of the show. Uh, this one, I, not necessarily a, a fan of the idea of it, just because we're really focused on the present right now, which is 2024, not 2025. Crispy Addict 500 says, would you prefer Dak or Shadur Sanders as the Broncos quarterback in 2025? To be honest with you, Sarah, I, I've seen a lot of this on social media. I've seen a lot of this uh, on different, you know, we've seen it on comments. I think Broncos fans are so eager for a quarterback option, like not, nothing against Dak Prescott, but look at what Dak, Dak was able to have a successful offense, you know, last year in Dallas, but what happened when it mattered, he sputtered and he didn't perform to his highest level. He threw some bad interceptions in the playoffs and games where it mattered most against the green Bay Packers team that really found a lot of momentum for me. Why are we so focused on options in 2025 when 2024 is right here and you have an opportunity right now in the NFL draft to get a guy for the long term, whereas Dak, he's another guy you're going to take a risk on as well, kind of similar to Russell Wilson, except he's going to be a free agent and not necessarily be traded for. Right, so I guess maybe the question is, would you rather have Dak Prescott or anybody else that's available between now and whenever he becomes available? And and I guess in that case, it's like, well, I mean, who knows if you really have a realistic shot at getting Dak Prescott, does it? But I guess if I had to choose between Dak or Shadur Sanders, I'm taking Dak Prescott yeah, because easily. I feel like, you know, he's got the opportunity to help you win immediately. Whereas Shadur Sanders is still an unproved, he's still playing at the college level. I mean, my goodness, it's not like the guy's the number one overall pick in this year's draft or something like that. So I get the uh, allure being that he plays at Colorado and that he's Dion's kid and he, he was impressive at times last year, but mm -hmm. I would take Dak Prescott, Cody, all day, every day, and twice on Sundays over anybody in the 2024 draft or 2025 draft. But the unfortunate reality is, is like, who knows if the Broncos would ever be able to get him. Well, the thing about Shadur is like, you know, obviously he played this one year, obviously at CU, playing against bigger competition than he did when he was at Jackson State. I need to see how he does this year to have a more informed opinion on him. Like, like you said, I thought with as bad as their offensive line was at CU this past year, he made some impressive plays happen. But at times, I mean, it was just the Shadur show, and you need to be able to have a run game. Like, he struggled with that, like not having a run game. He had to put everything on his shoulders. It ended up getting him hurt. You have to be able to protect yourself at times. So I need to see another year of Shadur to maybe have a more clear-cut opinion on whether or not I would take him. But, you know, folks, on 2024, I think if Denver sees that they have a guy that they really like, they're going to go out and they're going to try to get him. So that's a great question there. Colt Lathrop says, do you guys think that the Peyton Peyton brain trust should explore trading out of 12 into the 20s, grab more assets, and go D-line quarterback in round two and round three? Sarah, like for me personally, I think – Instead of trading back, look, we, we've seen Denver trade up into round two. They did it last year to get Marvin Mims. I don't necessarily think trading back at this point is going to be the best option for Denver. I think, yeah, it would be great to have a round two pick. Denver might still be able to do that by 
trading away some of their back end draft capital here with the eight picks that they have. I think you got to take whoever, like, you got to take the player at 12, right? Whoever it may be. Or if you're trading up, you got to do that. I don't necessarily think that trading back right here is something that they should explore. How do you feel about it? I think it might be the ideal situation. If, you're, if your plan is to take either Michael Penix or Bo Nix, I think the ideal scenario is to be able to trade down, get a second round pick, and take one of those guys. So then you could use a second rounder and whatever beyond that you would get in compensation to be able to build around that quarterback and get him another weapon in round two or get him an offensive tackle in round two or something like that and just really – fortify this roster with young players that you feel like hey if you agree with ESPN and they've got the third worst roster in the league find ways to add those darts I think if your target is Bo Nix or Michael Penix Jr. there may not be a more ideal scenario to me than to trade down and still get them Alex sends in a question I feel like it is an important one to address his do you too believe a part of Cody Rager being poached by the Broncos is to give a potential internal candidate to move on from Peyton if ownership and SP decide to do so me personally, I don't think that's the case. There's no way, like if you're George Payton, that move happens if that's the idea that you're even going to stay on. Like you may say, hey, just let me go and I'm going to go find my footing elsewhere. I don't think that's the case. I think Cody brings a great insight from his college and scouting background. You're going to have that element there because he's obviously the VP of player personnel. Like that's a big, big role for him to have here. George is going to operate really well, very well respected in NFL circles. And ultimately, it's not Sean Payton's decision to make. Now he could go to Greg Penner if the relationship didn't work out and say, hey, this not working out. Get me a new GM. And then, of course, you might have an internal candidate. I don't think that's how they would operate, though. I think it's very dangerous to do something like that. Uh, but like I said, it goes back to it. Their relationship is great. So I want to get your thoughts on this. Yeah, I think that if if George Payton was going to be leaving the Broncos, Cody, and he still could. I mean, anything could happen, but I just don't feel like with as many jobs as became available this past offseason, like you think the Broncos would be holding him hostage until after the draft and and say like, look, we're going to let you go after the draft. I know all these great jobs are available. It just feels like the organization has operated at a, a level right now where they're doing right by players, they're doing right by coaches. I don't think that George Payton's job is honestly as like, I don't think his seat is on fire like a lot of people seem to believe because George, yes, he's he whiffed on the Russell Wilson deal. He pivoted to, you know, Russell after hiring Nathaniel Hackett to seemingly try and get Aaron Rodgers. So, like, I think you can go back to all these decisions that he's made and trace it back to one you know, Aaron Rodgers making a decision not to come to Denver and forcing George Payton to pivot off of that move. At least that's what I perceive it to be, Cody. So I know that he still deserves blame for things that have gone wrong. But like you said, he's trusted, well-respected around the NFL, and he would have been first in line for a lot of these jobs that opened up this offseason if the Broncos would have let him go. And the fact that they didn't, I think, speaks volumes. Our last one comes in from Darcy Tiernan. She asked the question, is there any hope that Luke Wattenberg has developed into a decent center? Uh, to be honest with you, Darcy, we don't necessarily know the answer to that now, though I will say this. I felt like watching Luke last year at practice, talking to Luke in the lo locker room, like I would go up to him and Alex Forsythe. They're locker room buddies. They sit right next to each other, and I would talk to them during Washington, Oregon week. But we'd just talk about you know that specific dynamic in the Pac-12, but then we'd also talk about how the game has changed today I even asked Luke, you know, what he's learned really from his rookie season, where to be honest with you, he got thrown into the fire. And I even asked Nathaniel Hackett after a game and said, you know, what do you do in a situation like that? Like, have you spoken? Like, what's your confidence level in Luke after his rough performance of getting thrown in? And even Hackett himself said, we didn't do a great enough job as coaches. We put him in a situation where, you know, we didn't feel like we put him in the best position to succeed. And I think that has to be considered. I do like what I've seen from him at times where he has stepped in a guard. Like, for example, he stepped in in that Chargers game when Quinn Miners had to go, obviously, to the hospital for a heart condition or an elevated heart rate there. Thought he did a really good job at the guard position. I thought he stepped in. So for me, I think that there is an aspect to it. I think he's going to be more of a guard than he is going to be a center. That's how I'm feeling about it. And maybe he's getting a little underrated because Alex Forsyth is the more recent selection, right? I know that the Broncos discussed at, I think it was the <laughs> combine or the annual NFL league meetings that, hey, we believe that we've got two options in-house at the center position. We like both of these guys. We like Forsyth. We like Wattenberg. Like you said, maybe he's shown a little better at guard at this point. So Forsyth is kind of more of a true center, even though he has played everywhere else. 
I like Wattenberg's potential, Cody. I mean, it's just a matter of getting him those reps more consistently. And cushionberry has been the incumbent. Now it's going to – we'll see how different Wattenberg plays now that there's an actual competition for that job. We'll see how it all pans out here. Broncos country is set to be a busy couple of weeks here on the Lockdown Broncos podcast for the buildup to the NFL draft plus the draft. When it happens, you're going to get recap, reaction, and more here on Locked On Broncos. One thing we have to talk about, though, Broncos country. You look at the landscape of the AFC. We just saw a major move inside of the conference with the Houston Texans acquiring Stephon Diggs at the wide receiver position, which goes to further show if you get the quarterback position right, you can elevate even further around your team. We're going to take a look at maybe how the Broncos can do that going forward on tomorrow's brand new episode, Locked on Broncos.